Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our class this morning. We're in the book of Leviticus, studying the chapters of Moses, the Pentateuch, and the great themes of the Pentateuch. Last week, we introduced some of the uh, recurring phrases in the sacrifices in the book of Leviticus. We were talking about the fact that God chose a holy nation, a separate designated nation, the children of Israel. And within that nation, he chose a holy family, a separate family, the family of Aaron, to be his priests. He chose a holy place, a designated place, a sanctuary, a dwelling place, a tabernacle that God would manifest his presence in to dwell among his people. Um, he designated a number of holy things, the furniture, the incense, the the oil for the lamps in the tabernacle. Um, all of this was designed to give people a way to come into the presence of God and maintain a relationship with God uh, through drawing near to Him in worship. Uh, last week in our session, we talked about some of the recurring phrases in the sacrificial uh, part of um, the book of Leviticus. For example, uh, we talked about that they should uh, bring their sacrifice to the tabernacle, that they should lay their hands upon the head of the sacrifice to identify with the sacrifice. We talked about the sprinkling of the blood uh, against the altar. Uh, we talked about the guilt that is held in the mind of God uh, against that person until God lets go of that guilt and forgives the sin. We talked about the fact that the priest would make atonement for them or cover up that sin by doing these sacrifices and that they would be forgiven. Uh, we talked about the fact that these sacrifices were an aroma pleasing unto the Lord, that God smelled the sincerity of the worship, the submission of the worship, the obedience of the worship. All of these things were uh, thematic and, and crucial points in the idea of how a person would approach God in worship in order to maintain that relationship with God and take care of the, the sin problem in one's life. As we continue our thoughts this week uh, in the book of Leviticus to, to touch some of these uh, thematic ideas about how these people were to maintain this covenant relationship with the God that chose them to be his people. I want to begin in Leviticus chapter 3 with something that has ties to New Testament theology and that is what's called the fellowship offering or the peace offering. In many of your versions it's called the peace offering. In some of your versions it's called the fellowship offering. This is a sacrifice that was offered um, to God to show a good relationship with God, a positive relationship with God, a, a situation of friendship between uh, oneself and God. Uh, the peace, the word peace is shalom. Uh, the word for this peace offering is shalomim. And it is in chapter 3 that this is described. When a person brought a peace offering or a fellowship offering, uh, an integral part of that offering was a meal that the person would eat with God. Uh, part of the animal was offered on the altar to God, and that was considered food for God, like God's part of the meal. If you look at Ezekiel, excuse me, Leviticus chapter three, verse eleven, it says, "The priest shall burn them on the altar as food." an offering made to the Lord by fire. So that's God's food, and then the offerer would eat his or her food. The same phrase is in chapter 3, verse 16. The priest shall burn them on the altar as food, an offering made by fire, a pleasing aroma, and all the fat belongs to the Lord. So the idea was that Part of the animal is offered on the altar to God. That's God's part of the meal, you might say. And part of the animal is actually cooked and eaten by the family that brings the offering. And in doing so, 
they basically eat a meal with God, like you're sitting down as friends and you're eating a meal together. Um, eating a meal was often a sign of a covenant, an agreement. In the book of Genesis, when Jacob and Laban made a covenant with each other, they sat down and ate a meal to show their relationship. In uh, Exodus chapter 24, when God made the covenant with um, Israel, it says in verse 9 that Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up the mountain, and they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. Watch this part. And they saw God, and they ate and drank. So when they made a covenant with God, they ate and drank up on the mountain with God to show their relationship, their fellowship with God. In this peace offering that was done in chapter 3, and is talked about later in uh, the book of Leviticus as well, the meal with God showed thanksgiving. It showed good relationship between the person and God. Um, we have in the New Testament a, an offering that is similar to this and an ideal that is similar to this in the Lord's Supper. Uh, Christ is our sacrifice in the Lord's Supper. The body of Christ was prepared as our sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5. And that body of Christ was offered once for all. Yet, symbolically, in the Lord's Supper, we are eating the sacrifice. We are eating part of the body of Christ. We are sharing a meal to show good relationships between ourselves and God. Why do I have a good relationship with God? Because Jesus is my sacrifice. Because God accepts that sacrifice on my behalf. Because... He and I can be one. We can be reconciled because of Jesus. And so things are good between myself and God. And that's one of the things we're saying as we uh, come before the Lord in the Lord's Supper. I want you to look at a passage with me real quickly from the book of Hebrews that talks about this peace offering aspect of, of the Lord's Supper, which was very familiar uh, to the Jews. It's Hebrews chapter 13, and if you'll look with me at verse 10, Hebrews 13, verse 10. The background of this verse is that the people understood that some of their offerings that they brought to the Lord in Judaism were eaten as meals with the Lord, as fellowship offerings. So listen to what Hebrews 13, 10, verse says. We, it's talking about Christians. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. You see, when a person brought a sacrifice in the book of Leviticus, that was their sacrifice. It applied to them and their family. They then were the only ones that had a right to eat of that sacrificial meal with the Lord because it was their sacrifice. Only when Jesus is my sacrifice, only when I've accepted him as my sacrifice, only when I've been baptized into his death do I have a right to claim his sacrifice as mine, and only then do I have a right to eat. But the Jewish people who had not accepted Jesus, those that were still bound to Judaism, they had no right to eat from the Christian altar. Again, the altar is where something is killed, where something is sacrificed. Our altar is Jesus' cross where he was killed. But we eat from that altar, and others that have not claimed Christ as their sacrifice have no right to eat from that altar. There's a lot of theology in this that still applies to us today. And so when we eat the Lord's Supper, we're saying, Lord, Jesus is my sacrifice. I have claimed his redemptive work as mine. And because of his sacrifice, you accept me, Lord, and there's peace and good relationship uh, between us. All right, so that's a great principle 
that we can glean uh, from the book of Leviticus. If you continue on through um, this, just one more passage. In chapter 7, it talks again about the fellowship offering, the peace offering, and the eating of the meal with God. And it says in verse 15, The meat of this fellowship offering of thanksgiving must be eaten on the day it is offered. He must leave none of it until the morning. Um, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, when uh, Elkanah you know, brought his family, Hannah and, Sa and Samuel and all the rest, you know, Hannah, before Samuel was born, uh, it shows that they were eating part of the sacrifice. That was an example in Scripture that we have of, of this kind of an offering. So, for our purposes this morning, remember that we have a fellowship offering, and that is the fellowship meal with God in the Lord's Supper, and that we also eat the sacrifice and therefore participate in the sacrifice because we have claimed that sacrifice as our own. Now, in Leviticus chapter 8, if we continue through the book of Leviticus, we have the ordination of the priests. In Exodus 28 and 29, the instructions were given for the priestly clothing and for the ordination of the priesthood. In Leviticus 8 and 9, we have the actual carrying out of those instructions. And they did everything as the Lord commanded Moses. That phrase is repeated uh, throughout the section. In order to set apart or consecrate these men for service, it's interesting some of the things that were done. Look at chapter 8 of Leviticus, verse 5. Moses said to the assembly, This is what the Lord has commanded to be done. Moses brought Aaron and his sons forward and washed them with water. The word wash there is rakots, which means to immerse them. They were immersed in water. And then they put their clothes on that were the holy garments that God had uh, ordained for them to put on. See, it says in verse 7, Then they put on the tunic on Aaron, tied the sash around him, clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod on him. If you look back in Exodus, you can see each of these uh, articles of clothing um, described in detail and designated by God. So they immerse them in water, and then they put those clothes on. Paul seems to have this imagery in mind in Galatians 3 when he says, as many of us as were immersed into Christ did put on Christ. And only when we're immersed into Christ and we put on Christ are we ready then to go and serve God in the tabernacle of living stones, his church. So notice that in uh, Leviticus chapter 8, the anointing oil in verse 12 was poured on Aaron's head and he was anointed to set him apart. The word anointed is the word Christ or Messiah. And so Aaron was an anointed one, just like the kings were anointed ones. Um, there were sacrifices offered for these priests to cleanse them and consecrate them, to make atonement for them. And the blood was sprinkled, and all of this was pleasing to God. Notice in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 23, Moses slaughtered the ram and took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. And Moses also brought Aaron's sons forward and put some of the blood on the lobes of their right ears and the thumbs of their right hand and the big toes of their right feet. So God was basically saying these ears are set apart to hear the things of God. These hands are set apart to do the work of God. These feet are set apart to go and do the work of God. And so 
these priests that were set apart to serve in the tabernacle of the Lord were consecrated completely to the work of the Lord in very meaningful uh, ceremony. <clears throat> and all of this was done as the Lord commanded. Why was it done? Because God designated it to be done. God was setting these people apart as separate and holy to be mediators between his people and himself. They were to help people come near God in worship. They were to help in making atonement for the people through sacrifice. And so the priests began their ministry and they began to offer these sacrifices and they began to facilitate the relationship between God and his people so that God could stay close to his people and his people could always draw close to God. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 9 verse 22. After they started making these sacrifices, then Aaron lifted his hands toward the people and blessed them, meaning he prayed for them. And having sacrificed the sin offering, the burnt offering and the fellowship offering, he stepped down. Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting, and when they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. You see, what happened was that the people had submitted to God. They had complied with God. They were doing as God asked in order to draw near to God. And it was successful. God was pleased. God was present. God was happy. He was happy to be among his people. That's the desire that all of us have in a relationship with God. We want to submit to the Lord and seek to do his will and to approach him in the way that he has asked us to. And God is pleased and happy and we have a peaceful relationship with one another. That's, that's what we all desire. But no sooner had they started on the right foot that they got onto the wrong foot. And this very important lesson comes out in Leviticus chapter 10. Let's read together. Verse 1. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers and put fire in them and added incense. And they authored strange or unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And so fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died. Moses then said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke of when he said, Among those who approach me, I will show myself holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. And Aaron remained silent. Now, this is a strange story to us, but if you go back to the book of Exodus um, in chapter 28, when God was describing to the priests the clothing that they wore and the conduct that they were to have when they tried to draw near to the holy God in his tabernacle, um, when it talked about the things that Aaron was required to wear, he wore this robe that had little bells around the bottom of it, and it says, Exodus 28, verse 35, Aaron must wear it when he ministers. The sound of the bells will be heard when he enters the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out so that he will not die. See, the theology of Leviticus is that God is holy and pure and sinless and separate and that it's difficult for sinful man to approach and be accepted by the holy God. And because it's difficult, man must do as God directs and respect the wishes of God in drawing near to God, or man will suffer the consequences. Well, um, throughout this narrative in the book of Exodus, God designates the holy things, the the designated things, the specified things that people are to use in order to approach him. And in chapter 30 of Exodus, verse 34 through 38, God designated a special 
holy incense that was to be made with a certain recipe and that was to be offered before the Lord uh, by these priests. And it would be holy. Holy means designated, specified by God. But in this chapter, in Leviticus chapter 10, Nadab, Nadab and Abihu uh, offered to God something that had not been designated by God. It had not been commanded by God. Um, the NIV here translates this unauthorized fire. And that's not bad because holy means authorized. It means specified by God. The Hebrew word for strange means something other than what was authorized. So when they offered strange or unauthorized fire, they were specifically not giving what God demanded to be given in Exodus 30. They gave something else. And the response of God was not acceptance. It was anger. It was the consuming of those that dared try to come before God uh, in a way that was unauthorized. Later on, in the book of Numbers, in Numbers chapter 16, unauthorized people tried to come before the Lord. Korah and Dathan and Abiram, they tried to come before the Lord and they were not the children of Aaron. They were not God's authorized or specified priests. And these people were actually killed as well because they were not authorized to come before God. And the little censers that they used to try to approach God were taken after their destruction and beaten into a cover for the altar. But I want you to listen to number 16, verse 40. As the Lord directed him through Moses, this was to remind the Israelites that no one... No stranger who is not a descendant of Aaron should come near to burn incense before the Lord, or he would become like Korah and his followers. A stranger or unauthorized person is anyone other than those priests that God has designated of the family of Aaron. So when Nadab and Abihu did not respect the designations, the holiness of God, they were killed. When Korah and his company did not respect the designated priests of God, they also lost their lives. What's the message? If we are going to come before the Lord and be accepted and gain God's favor, we're going to have to respect the things that God has designated. We have to respect the holiness of God and not try to um, offer things which are unauthorized before the Lord. In the story of Nadab and Abihu, or Abihu, in chapter 10 of Leviticus, Aaron, the father of these priests, was not even allowed to mourn because of the disrespect that these men showed to the Lord. Um, in verse 6, Leviticus 10, verse 6, Moses said to Aaron and his sons Eleazar and Ithamar, see that's the two he has left now. He had Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. <clears throat> so he said to them, Do not let your hair become unkempt, and do not tear your clothes, or you will die, and the Lord will be angry with the whole community. But your relatives, all the house of Israel, may mourn for those that the Lord has destroyed by fire. Do not leave the entrance to the tent of meeting, or you will die, die because the Lord's holy anointing oil is on you. Look at verse 8. Then the Lord said to Aaron, You and your sons are not to drink wine or other fermented drink whenever you go into the tent of meeting. Or you will die. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. You must distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean, and you must teach the Israelites all the decrees the Lord has given through Moses. <clears throat> 
to distinguish between the holy and the common, the holy and the strange, is to distinguish between the things that God has designated or authorized and the things that God has not designated, the things that God has not authorized. This principle, which is in the book of Leviticus and in the Pentateuch, is a principle which still holds true today, that we should respect the things that God has authorized and not try to add in things that are not authorized by God. Uh, especially, I think, in, when it comes to things God has designated for worship, when we approach God uh, in worship. So this principle is a great one. Now, <clears throat> um, later on in Scripture, in the book of Chronicles, there is the story of uh, a man who was involved in the carrying of the Ark of the Covenant. David wanted to move the Ark of the Covenant uh, to a new place with the tabernacle, and they put the Ark on a cart. They didn't do like it said in the law and carry the Ark on poles, long poles that were that were inserted in rings on the side of the ark. And these poles were to keep anyone from coming near and touching the ark. But instead of doing that, they put it on a cart. And the cart started to tip over, and Uzzah reached out to touch the ark to, to keep it from falling, and he was killed. A lot of people read that and say, well, that's just not fair. Well, if you continue reading through the book of Chronicles, it says that David, you know, went back and checked God's law here in the God of Moses, uh, the law of Moses, and realized that the law of Moses described how you're supposed to carry that ark, and the Levites had not paid any attention to that, and that's the reason the guy got killed is because they didn't do what the Lord said to do, and then when they eventually brought up the ark and did it the right way, everything was fine. You see, because they respected the designations of God, the holiness of God. Do we respect the designations of God? Simply because God designated it that way, is that enough for us that we respect those things? Or would we insist, as some of these did, in deviating from the things that God has designated it's an important question. It, it speaks to the character of God and how God wants man to submit to him. This principle of approaching God in worship and, and staying close to God by doing as God has commanded and that there are certain conditions that have to be met continues in chapter 11 and following of Leviticus where he talks about things that are clean and unclean or more appropriately, things that could make a person clean or unclean. If you go back to Leviticus 10, verse 10, you must distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean. Uncleanness meant that in that state you were not acceptable to come before God. Now, uncleanness was not the same as sin, but it still said that if you're unclean ceremonially, you're not acceptable to come into the presence of God. And you had to make sure that you were clean or acceptable to come into God's presence. There were certain foods that were not acceptable uh, to eat. They would render you unclean. There were certain conditions or physical bodily emissions that would make you Unclean. There were certain diseases, skin diseases, and others that would make you unclean or unacceptable. And any time someone was deemed ceremonial unclean, they had to bathe themselves and wash themselves in water. It is the word that means to immerse themselves. So, um, to summarize all of this so far, God is holy, God is perfect, God is pure, God is separate. And for man who is sinful and flawed to approach the holy God, it takes special conditions. Thanks be to God that Christ has supplied those special conditions for us. Well, this involves for us, of course, 
Jesus Christ and his redemptive work. And it involves a respect on our part for the holiness of God, for the things that God has designated. <clears throat> Lord willing, uh, next week in our class, we will um, finish some thoughts from the book of Leviticus and we'll begin uh, some study of the book of Numbers, which is really called In the Wilderness. Look forward to seeing you then. I hope you're blessed this week. Stay safe. God bless you. We'll talk to you again soon. Faithful love flowing down from the thorn covered crown makes me whole, saves my soul, washes whiter than snow. Faithful love calms each fear, reaches down, dries each tear, holds my hand when I can't stand on my own. Faithful love, from above, came to earth to show the Father's love, and I'll never be the same, for I've seen faithful love face to face. Jesus is his name, for I've seen faithful love face to face, and Jesus is his name.